my nice new brother WP1 word processor. I could connect the Raspberry Pi up to the UART. I am actually going to take the time to write a whole new terminal emulator. So I think that is actually ready to test. So I'm going to stop on a cliffhanger and get on to the testing next time. Okay, moment of truth time. Let's try it and see if it works. Now, I am also trying a new technique for recording the video from the Brother device. This is using a webcam which does at least have manual focus. The picture quality is still not brilliant, and as I mentioned before, a lot of that is the fault of this cable, which is screwing up the video somewhat. I should really have used a more shielded one. Anyway, let's try this and see what happens. And the answer is nothing, which means my bootloader is broken. The Z180MMU is an absolute pain to configure. Okay. Uh, well, better. Uh, okay, so I'm apparently clearing the screen to the wrong value, which is zero rather than the space, and I am not configuring the attribute memory, which is why some of it's shown up in reverse. And it's, while it's printed the boot message, it hasn't actually, you know, started booting. So after not overwriting the current program, let's try this. Well, we're clearing the screen. It's not loading anything off disk. That's probably because, because, because the memory map it currently in use is not the same as the original boot sector and the temporary buffer used to load stuff off disk is in the wrong place. Okay, let's try this one. Interesting. It's not really what I expected, but at least you can see on the screen here. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it's coming out. I didn't set this thing up to record inverse video, but I am at least getting superscript. Yeah, I think this is wrong. Fun though. So boot it. And nothing happens. We are at least clearing the screen, which is nice. Well, I managed to fix the bugs in the bootloader, mainly by throwing it away and starting again with the CPM-ish bootloader. And as a result, our application runs, sort of. So that's interesting. The snow is clearly due to video memory refresh. So I think the application's actually running and is completely failing to update the screen properly. I'm not quite sure where the changing characters are, which as you see have just stopped. So I suspect that some workspace is in video memory somehow. That means register corruption. The fact that it hasn't removed the boot go message, which is produced by the bootloader, I'll fire it up again, is interesting because that means we failed to clear the screen. So I think the first place to look is the screen refresh code. Here's the routine to clear the screen. And I do notice this, CPA comma D is a regrettable typo which is going to compare A against D. The, the A is implicit because in, in CP the A is implicit because you can only compare A with things. So uh, this is going to be comparing whatever happens to be in A, which is whatever garbage this has left behind, with what's in D. This should be an LD. 
So I think that this has been this is spinning forever writing to the screen. Now where those garbage values were coming from well if you pass in a line number out of range then the display code is going to look that up against back buffer address table so uh, no actually that doesn't make any sense because it will be clearing random bits of garbage it'll be reading the address of a non-existent line and then trying to clear it where's our clear routine here uh, also it's trying to write zeros the character zero to the screen rather than a literal constant zero that's not going to work okay well those are at least two bugs so let's give this a try and it boots and that's interesting we get exactly the same thing so I wonder the garbage on the screen not the snow but the the strange characters this is clearly counting down you see it just stops there and then the snow changes I wonder if we've never actually got to the display flush code at all and in fact it's hung somewhere else or rather it's clearly not hung because the snow indicates it's writing to the video memory so if it's spinning doing something really stupid and not reach the flush code then that explains why the screen hasn't cleared because the first thing the program does is try to clear the screen maybe it's the clear screen code that's gone wrong it is after all it does look like it's counting so we've got something going on here some garbage and then this looks like two bytes counting down and there's a flashing quotation mark just to the right of it yes the easiest way to debug this kind of thing is to simply insert uh, calls to jump to yourself that is infinite loop throughout the startup code it becomes very easy to tell how far things have gotten well the problem actually turns out to be really straightforward so in our flush code we are copying from the back buffer to the video ram starting at video ram base however the video ram actually consists of two 4k chunks one for the attributes and one for the character data uh, what I didn't cover in the previous video is changing everything to update the character RAM rather than the video RAM and it looks like I forgot to change this so we just need to do that and hopefully it should now be writing to the right place so let's write this back and boot something should have changed so after inserting one of these right at the very beginning of our program we still get garbage this means that none of the program is actually running so this suggests it's a bootloader issue well we can see the go message and then what we do is we do some memory fiddling and jump to the beginning of the program so there shouldn't really be anything out of the ordinary there uh, I do need to check to make sure that all the all the places where the program starts which are coded in agree so there's one here 
and there's also the one in the make file which is here this tells the linker where things go and then there's this LD80 in this mode returns a 64k memory image and so we need to remove the the bit we're not using. Well that does actually seem to be the right value. So what could be happening? Well the first thing to do is to make sure everything is assembling to the code we think it is. So let's do that. That causes listings to be produced by when compiling sim files, which is a command image. It's the same as a com file as far as LD80 is concerned. And uh, that lets gives us a listing for the bootloader. So this shows the the opcodes that the uh, the assembler is actually generating. So where are we? Here is the go code. So here are the five instructions to rework the to reconfigure the video but can reconfigure the memory manager uh, yeah um, I'll just talk about the memory manager a bit so there's this big long comment up here that describes it but basically the Z180 memory manager gives you three banks of memory the first one is called base and always starts at logical address zero and is always mapped to physical address zero. The second one is called bank and you can change both the mapping and the division point. And the third one is called common and again you can change the mapping and the, the division point. So they always have to appear in this order. Common is always above bank which is always above base. And we need base to be uh, that's wrong. Base always points at the brother OS kernel. It allows us to do system calls. Bank can, is the code the application actually lives in. And it is always mapped at this physical address and this logical address. Uh, common starts at E000 and it either points at the video memory which lives at the this address range in physical RAM or the disk buffers which we use when loading the program which are at this address in physical RAM. So when we load the program we actually have to keep switching between uh, having the disk buffers available so that we can call the system call to read sectors and having the video RAM available so that we can write stuff to the screen. Well once the program is loaded we no longer need the disk buffers so we switch permanently into video RAM mode before calling the application start point. Now are we loading the program to the wrong place? Because the the configuration we've got here is actually slight, subtly different from the one that CPM is uses. The way the load works is we read sectors, we always put them into a temporary buffer, this is why we need a disk buffers block we then use the DMA engine to copy out of the temporary buffer and into uh, user RAM. 
We use the DMA engine both because it's fast and because the DMA engine always works with physical memory which makes life easier when loading CPMish. However, copying 12 sectors is not exactly time intensive and for our particular use case we always have the target memory mapped so I think we should actually be able to get rid of this we can replace this with a simple LDIR which should simplify things so I'm finally beginning to remember which way round LDIR goes so HL is the source address and this is always this buffer uh, uh, LD is the destination address and we keep the pay the destination page here in D, so E is always correct. We just have to, D is always correct, we just have to put a zero into the bottom byte. BC is always 100 because it's one sector. Okay, it's possible that this configuration is wrong, you see. So advance the next sector, next address, reduce the, the sector count by one, and loop. Actually, yes, let's leave that. And then we turn the motor off and go. So that is now a simpler bootstrap code. Which is here. I see reasonable looking values. So try that and see if that makes any difference. Boot. No, no it doesn't. Well this isn't helping. This is setting the stack pointer for our program. Uh, putting it here means that we're using the system stack in the uh, common workspace that the disk buffers live in. And of course, every time we switch to the video memory, the stack becomes inaccessible. So if we leave it in video memory mode, then the stack goes into video memory. So possibly that is what's writing to the screen. Now, the obvious thing is to just move the stack somewhere else, but uh, we can't make system calls unless the stack is here. But of course, there's no reason why we can't simply switch for a different stack down here. So let's try this. Uh, our so that means our program lives at app start and goes up, and our stack starts at app start and goes down. That will program goes here, so that means the stack starts at the high part of actually let's put that somewhere else because of course we don't know how much of that memory block is being used let's put that here so the program goes from 7000 up we know this is ordinary RAM 
So that should be fine at this point. The odd thing is, I still don't know why all the where all the noise is coming from. So I think that I am going to just try and write out what byte is at app start before we do anything else. This will mean copying the uh, hex print code, which I got rid of, but we can steal a copy from CPMish. Uh, that's now hang on, we can in our common utils print.lib this so let's just copy this st stick that here and this want to be put byte So we're just going to do load whatever's app start into A and print it. Okay, just check to make sure that our bootloader's not too big. This is our program. Here is our bootloader and we're close. We have uh, about 23 bytes remaining, but that will fit. So, what I I would expect to get a zero zero because that is the first byte of the program that's hang on that's not right zero zero that is a knob I never pulled told it to put a knob there that's our JR this value is wrong off by one that's better well, that won't help, but it shouldn't have caused that mess. So where is the noise coming from? Well, normally the memory that lives at lives in this block is the kernel workspace. It's the brother operating system. But we've just swapped it out in favor of the video memory. This is safe because we've turned interrupts off. So I wonder whether one of these system calls we're making has turned interrupts back on. Now the difference between this and CPM-ish is this routine here to turn the motor off. So let's do this. Because it's possible that this is in fact working and this is executing our infinite loop but there's an interrupt routine which is updating variables in kernel memory. Of course, now the kernel memory has been replaced by the video memory, therefore it's updating the video memory. CPMish has this call in it, so the problem can only be this one check to make sure no we're not calling EI anywhere so let's try this and it works we have a clean screen so yes that was clearly the problem this means that we can now go and turn back on bits of our program and see what comes out so how does it look boot good good uh, the eyes are wrong, but the cursor is flashing, which means it's initialized the video display. It's tried to clear the screen. So 
Well, the only thing to do now is to hit the return key and see if anything comes out. No, of course it doesn't. Okay, uh, I I will see if I can. Let me just. I have the the Raspberry Pi keyboard here too. So let me just poke something to the serial terminal, see if it works in that direction. Uh, cat to dev tty ama0. No. Okay, so we can fix the screen clearing. And you'll notice that it's nice and crisp. So it's either hung or our video refresh code is working. Well, this is weird. Sometimes, when I boot it, I get this keyboard error message. This is coming from the Brother operating system. And I don't know where that could be coming from. My entire program is running with interrupts disabled and I'm never calling into the Brother operating system. I'm doing everything myself and talking to the hardware myself. So this suggests that something is being corrupted somewhere, probably on the stack, resulting in a hyperspace jump when things go wrong. And I'm now wondering about that stack position. Is there actually memory there? Well, I know there is because CPM-ish uses it. I will try relocating it and seeing what happens. Well, look what I found. Current state used to be a byte. Now it's a pointer. And it's a pointer to the state routine that we're calling. So by initializing this to, well, a zero in the low byte, it's going to cause all kinds of weird things. So yes, we're getting our hyperspace jump when we... Uh, the first time we go through TTY put C, it's calling whatever address is in there. So there's a zero in the low byte. There's probably a zero in the high byte. So it's uh, probably going to try and reset the system but we're not doing it right because, you know, we're just calling zero with all the wrong memory. So bad things happen. So we initialize the state instead to state waiting, and hopefully that will work better. So I now have some code in place that will attempt to write lots of dots to the screen. Of course, we have a handy TTY PUTC routine for writing text, which is useful for tracing. Let me show you what happens when I try it. That was the machine crashing and rebooting. So we are printing some stuff onto the screen. It's kind of not working. The fact that it seems to work for a bit, even though it's printing the wrong characters, before rebooting suggests that it's the terminal state is going wrong. For example, uh, scrolling off the bottom of the screen, uh, if the cursor Y position goes out of bounds, then we've got this lookup table to look up the, each line in the back buffer so we may pick up a valid in, an invalid address from there and just start writing gibberish all over memory. But that's definitely progress. Well, here's some stuff that's wrong. When we call print A to print the character, uh, on entry, A is uh, whatever's left over after we've subtracted lots of values here and C contains the real value. However, uh, we seem to have defined it to take the char in A, so A is garbage. So we change that to that, 
and uh, copy C into A, then we should at least get correct output text. So there's more stuff going on. So uh, we get the address of cursor X, we inc increment HL. Uh, if it is not the screen width, we go straight to update cursor. If it is the screen width, we reset X to zero and go to TCY line feed, which is here. Uh, if A is on, if we are on the last line of the screen, scroll up, otherwise move the cursor down one. So scroll up is straightforward. All we're going to do is uh, delete line zero on the screen and leave the cursor where it is. We have uh, so I do think we have print printable. We have actually moved the cursor and TTY line feed may not actually call. Wow, unexpected phone call. Um, I've forgotten that people actually called people on phones. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, Yes, I was looking at the cursor motion. I was wondering if there was a code path where the cursor would be m moved, but update cursor wasn't being called. But to be honest, this it's sounding like a crash is happening when we hit scroll up, which is course calls delete line, which is in the display routine which of course is doing this stuff and this is very likely to be wrong. Uh, if we're doing a LDR with the wrong parameters, then uh, we're going to just like uh, copy garbage around in memory and be very likely to corrupt things. If we mangle the stack, then return parameters will be incorrect and, uh, you know, the system's going to crash. So let's... Uh, let's just disable this and yeah and let's just see if it crashes still well it's not crashing but we're still getting the eyes I'm not sure if it's coming through in the camera but the uh, those are actually double barred eyes for some reason it seems to be the character the thing prints if you give it a invalid screen code the snow is interesting because we don't seem to get that when uh, when we're not printing to the screen. And it should take the same amount of work whenever you flush the screen. So... Oh, I know what's going on. And that is going to be a pig to fix. Yeah, I'll come back to that later, I think. But uh, we are definitely making progress. So let's try and fix delete line then. Well, this ain't gonna help. Yeah, the back buffer address table was all wrong. I have also added a new file, uh, th this print.z80. Uh, let's put that down here where it belongs. Uh, this again is stolen from CPM-ish. It contains all the uh, number printing and string printing routines. So we're gonna go to Dell here, but instead of 
actually doing the copy we are going to we are going to we're going to not do anything because there's a non-zero chance that now I fix the back buffer table this should work do you think it worked of course it didn't work but it did fail in an interesting way so the you can see the row of dots down the middle of the screen it should have filled up the entire screen so this suggests that the cursor is not being placed correctly there's snow we expect to see snow uh, the cursor itself is flickering around I would only expect to see the cursor on the last row of the screen and the right hand border has got a barred eye in it so that's not being cleared properly are we printing the characters in the wrong place well on entry to dpy print a we have de is y comma x y is in d it's the high byte x is in e the low byte so we call uh, calc back, back buffer address D has not been touched anywhere so D is the the Y byte and yeah that's not going to work each address is two bytes so in fact here we want to do a shift logical left by shift logical left a or just do an add a so that will double a so we're now properly indexing into the back buffer table and yeah we're doing exactly the same thing here luckily we're calling calc back buffer address everywhere so we're not actually directly referring to the tables anywhere. Okay, with luck that has uh, placed our text in the right place. Right, Del, uh, Del L. The thing that blank the you see if we're on the last line yeah then just go to blank last line otherwise do the scroll I think the scroll is at least doing something so blanking the last line looks like it's not working honestly this looks fairly straightforward forward HL is source DE is destination so the destination is well the source is the beginning of the last line the destination is one byte further on count is width minus one because the extra byte is done by the priming byte here. That looks okay, actually. Uh, um, so calculate the address of the line in DE. That puts the excuse me that puts the address in HL copy that to DE increment DE prime set the size fill and we know this works hmm it's possible that I've got this subtraction wrong different CPUs have well 
what SBC here is uh, subtract with carry. So it will subtract DE from HL, but also take into account the carry being passed in. This allows you to chain together multiple subtractions for arbitrary width stuff. The problem is different CPUs interpret the carry flag differently, and I do, do not recall whether the Z80 is a borrow flag or a carry flag system because if you uh, don't want a carry passed in you have to either set or reset the bit appropriately. It is indeed CCF so the subtract is DE minus HL minus the carry which in, because we've cleared it is zero. Okay well with luck, we should now be drawing text in the right place, but I'm not sure about the rest of it. I'm going to just try this and see what happens. So, boot. And it works. We are printing dots correctly. So, it was just the, uh, the back buffer table that was wrong. Good. So, we should now be able to... Well, we, we seem to be able to print stuff, or at least print dots. So uh, let's try and get more of the terminal working. I also got some myself some tea, as I'm yawning a lot. So uh, let's call keyboard push to try and get a value out of the ring buffer. And then called keyboard pull to pull a value out of the ring buffer and then tty put c to print it to the screen so we should now have a system where we type and keys show up on the screen assuming everything works which it almost certainly won't let's just have a quick skim through the code so keyboard push uh, reads the keyboard scan code. We copied all this from CPMH, so it should be relatively reliable. So convert scan code is doing the conversion. Keyboard type is our ring buffer. Uh, adds to the ring buffer. Keyboard pull pulls it out again. This is the state machine that runs the keyboard, keeping track of whether it's seen uh, like shift key down and up, caps lock, etc. All right, boot. Okay, now we press a key. Ooh. Uh it may not be showing up on the camera, but that was a Y. We're getting text. We are getting text. The cursor is entirely the wrong place. Let's get the cursor down to where things are a bit more stable. There we go. Uh, interesting that everything has suddenly gone to uppercase. What happens if I press the shift key to try and toggle it back to lower? Nope, still doesn't work. Caps lock. Okay, maybe I bumped the caps lock key. Space doesn't work. If I remember correctly, space is a scan code of zero, so maybe we're getting that wrong. The cursor position could be more correct, or, you know, at all correct. Uh, how about the code, which you can't see me t press because it's off the screen. Code A, B, C, D, E, yep. And this is generating garbage. Oh. Code J, of course, there's a line feed. Excellent. Oh, uh, yeah, the code... Code plus letters produce garbage because we don't support printing 
characters below 32. Uh, but code J a few times. Scrolls. This looks like at least this bit of our terminal emulator works. Uh, now, can I remember any... Oh yeah, I haven't tried shift. Yep, that works. Number keys. Yep. What about the cursor keys? They should actually do nothing because they will have extended values, but I haven't edited the key map yet. So they are still producing ADM3 escape uh, cursor control codes. Uh, let's try uh, just trying to remember any of the. Let's try escape shift A. No, escape shift E. That's cursor down. It is at least seems to be putting the cursor in the right place. Um, that's a square bracket, so escape square bracket was J clear screen. Well, it cleared something, but I don't think that was right. Escape, square bracket, J. No, escape, square bracket, J. I can't remember what that actually did. Uh, but yes, this does actually seem to be relatively, that one was delete, uh, relatively decent looking. So, Let's take a look at space and cursor key, cursor position. Okay, well, here's our conversion. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, key map generator. Look key tab, let's see. Uh, so the scan codes are here on the left. Um, Right-hand side contains the ASCII codes. So where is space? Here. Uh, that should have worked. Scan code OX20. So, I wonder if, right, this is wrong. Instead of ret z, we want ret c. Ret z was doing, is the key a space? If so, return now and do nothing. What we wanted was, is the key a lower code than a space? So that should be a c, good. Uh, what was the other issue? Cursor position. Well, the cursor is set with this. So we... Ha! No, wait. I thought we'd miss the doubling. Uh, D is the Y position, so we take we get the address of our table multiplied by two, add on to get the address of a position in the table. Right, we need to, you've done, put, done this in the wrong order. We need to load the value out of the table before we add on the x position. So that should do that bit. So it looks like we have lots of stuff working. 
Well, the next thing to do is to let's start pulling stuff out of the interface. In fact, let's just turn it all on because I don't think it will do any harm. Okay, let's boot it. Has not cleared the screen. Okay, well, let's press the return key. Nope. No, I think that's wedged. Uh, let's try doing the thing in the Raspberry Pi to emit text. Yeah, that's doing nothing. The cursors. You see here where we compare the state against RS readable and then return if the state is RS readable when we should be returning if the state is not RS readable. Yeah, I think that's probably going to make a bit of a difference. I have, for the time being, disabled all the keyboard stuff. Wait, what's that doing there? That shouldn't be there. Because it did seem to cause things to lock up, and I'm not sure why. So let's just see whether this side of things works. We should be able to cat stuff from the Raspberry Pi to our terminal and see things appear. So let's use the Raspberry Pi to dump some text. And what do you know? It works. Cool. And now let's press the return key. And it works. So I will just move that keyboard out of the way, move this one off camera and log in. Uh, yikes, why did that happen? Uh, you're not supposed to get text out at this point. Oh, it timed out. Right, I typed my password into the login prompt. Uh, newbie mistake there, I think. Okay, let's do this properly. Brilliant. Okay, so our terminal type is VT220. Let's set that to VT102. Uh, we're going to use, we have 14 rows and 91 columns. Okay, let's start VI, cross fingers, touch whatever superstitious material you like. Wow. Okay, well that's not worked. At least something's not working. I'd be. Uh, oh, hang on. How do I work this? Yeah, the, something's wrong. The. Day. Yeah, okay, cursors has got confused about the screen layout. Something is not right. But, ah, oh, and we got into cap, into uppercase, which is a little surprising. But a lot of that is working. So let's try a man page. We don't get any trailing M's. Something's not right in the bottom row. Okay, that's bad. Let's just restart the terminal. The state's got confused. Uh, what was the next thing you were to try? Oh yeah, word grinder. So this is a chunky cursors program. That has also got the terminal state confused. So the terminal's crashed. And we actually want to, can we exit word grinder? Let's 
escape. Nope, I'm going to have to kill this from the Raspberry Pi. Yep, there we go. Okay, well that wasn't so great. Uh, but a lot of things work. Now there's a... I'm pressing the tab key and it's not doing the right thing. I'm pressing the delete key and it's not doing the right thing. Well, there is a program called VT test, not spelt like that, which is supposed to test VT100 terminals. So let's just run the first test. That's not supposed to happen. Back to the other keyboard. Kill all VT test. And I think I'm going to have to restart the terminal. So this is a fair chunk of work to do. What's going on here? Oh, it's still running the program. Uh, what does modify test parameters do? Don't think there's anything useful there. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff works. I'll try terminal reports. That should. Okay, it's device status report. This is the testing the type back feature. Yep, it says report OK. Wait a minute. Test of device status report six report curse position. Report ism. Really? Ism? Square bracket zero zero five semicolon zero zero one R. Uh, unknown response. It doesn't like that. I suspect it doesn't like the leading zeros. I'll try that one again. I think it doesn't like the leading zeros. Um, let's try testing screen features. That's two. There should be three identical lines of stars completely filling the top of the screen. Test of wraparound mode setting. Yeah, these aren't going to work. We're not setting 132 column mode because this thing is limited to 91. So this one's irrelevant. We don't have a scroll up region. Yeah, the, none, none of this stuff is relevant to our program. Origin mode we haven't done. Attributes we haven't done. Save, restore, cursor feature. We have implemented and it does look like it works, although a lot of this is garbage. Let's try nano. Uh, that has not displayed properly. I don't know where the eights come from. We can type. Right, scrolling down is del line. Inserting, uh, scrolling up is ints line. But I do not know why that's not done anything useful. Ah, I know why it keeps switching to capital letters. I normally use this as a control key. So I have to press a different key 
on this. No, I don't want to save the modified buffer. Okay, so I'm just trying to get a handle on what might be broken. Uh, does, do we, are we still in the right? Missing argument two, and then it hangs? Really? Reboot the terminal. Interesting. And now it's doing the very slow text thing. Okay. So. So you run script to log output. STTY rows. Missing argument two and it hangs. Reboot the terminal, exit to exit the script. We now have a log in TypeScript, which we can look at using, yeah, that, uh, that uh, I need to fix that delete key, that's maddening. We can edit, we can look at with TypeScript. Uh, so you, down here, and I think my finger is show, showing up on the camera. You can see me typing STTY. Uh, I don't think I can scroll down without working cursor keys. I can go to a position, so let's go to CO. Go to 8O, is that gonna force it to, no. Nope. Go to DO, should force it to scroll. Only a little. So. Um, yes, that's not right. Luckily, there we go. Um, here at DO, you can see STTY missing argument two, and then uh, E2, eight zero, nine, eight rows. That's a Unicode character, that's what it is. E2, eight, zero, nine, eight. So that should be a, ha, uh, that's gonna be an open smart quote. And that's why it's just hung there because you can see from the context, it's probably just about to print a smart quote. So that gives us a place to look. So we need to fix uh, delete because otherwise I will go insane cursor keys and UTF-8.